to welcome everybody. Um, I would also like to thank um, uh, Eric Rosegard for taking in the Holistic Health Department, for everybody, faculty members, as well as staff, Demetrios and Jill. I would certainly like to thank Adam Burke for being a guiding inspiration in our Holistic Health Department, and for Rick and Jennifer and uh, Eric Pepper for continuing this series. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are going to be looking today at how we can maximize our health through things that we happen to have at home. I am, of course, a Chinese herbalist also. But today we're looking at something interesting. A lot of us might think that Chinese medicine is something very remote, something that comes from another side of the world. In fact, that's not the case. So this particular presentation has kind of two parts. The first is about what I would call integrative medicine, um, intersectionality, where we have a combination of different cultures and different systems of medicine which share commonalities and are come together along the Silk Road. What is the Silk Road? Why do we care? The Silk Road was a, uh, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it was a trans-Eurasian internet. Everything was being shared on the Silk Road. When we look at this, um, we can see, with Marco Polo standing over here in Italy, we can see it ran the extent of Central Asia, China, with, with also tentacles that were going down into India, Southeast Asia, etc. So what was really interesting is that they were not just, this was the, the way the landscape looked, high mountain passes, the use of camels, later horses, we have travelers who are traveling the Silk Road going from China to India to bring back Buddhist sutras. We have foreigners, meaning Westerners, who are coming to China. Some of them are bringing systems of medicine like Persian medicine with them. And we have Buddhism. Buddhism, Buddhist monks were traveling from China to India and to Central Asia, carrying not only just the beliefs of Buddhism, but also carrying medicine. And, um, and that was actually the dominant belief along the Silk Road until, uh, until Islam took over. So what was being traded along here? If we look at this slide, we see, wow, okay, jasmine, sandalwood, horses, lap dogs, almonds, right? All kinds of things besides foods and besides silk. Um, and because this was an international endeavor um, in various archeological sites, you have Indian naan, which are like flat tortillas, which are found together with Chinese dumplings because, again, it was intersectional and in intercultural. Many of the explorers that we're familiar with, Columbus, etc., Magellan, they went in search of spices, right? And so this could be called the spice route also. Sometimes when we talk about Tibet, it's called the musk route because Tibet, Tibetans have always been traders and they were trading musk, right? What I want to point out, even though some have said to me, no one is going to be interested, but I am interested, and you might find it surprising, that, hmm, over in this little corner of China down here, we have mummies that were found. They're not uh, Egyptian mummies. They were not wrapped in uh, linen. Rather, they were wrapped in plaid. They had come from southeast, south, southern Russia, they are Caucasian, Indo-European. They are tall, they have light hair, and they're wearing plaid. Wait a minute, like Celtic plaid, like Scottish tartan plaid? Oh, yes. So there they are over in the corner of China. The language that they're, that they're transmitting, if we just look at this, which is, again, you may not be a history buff, I am. So we see mother, Sanskrit, mater, Greek, and Latin. So these are Indo-European languages, meaning, just like they say in Disney World, it was a small world after all. Mm -hmm. um, looking at Chinese medicine, so the prototype that we're going to use when we look at foods later is Chinese medicine. Why? Because it's based on the natural world. It's based on what we see in the natural world. It's easy to grasp. We understand water. We understand fire. We understand cold. Just to point out here, the the dates involved here. So we have recorded uh, in, in various texts and in other kinds of artifacts, Chinese medicine from 3000 BC, right? Um, based on, wow, wood, fire, metal, water. Those who have been in my classes before, I see familiar faces. Uh, 
understand that this particular paradigm is one that we want to, just like a language, we begin to slowly internalize it. We can see it's that these, each of these elements is connected with an organ system like the liver or the heart. Why is this important? Once you understand what constitution you are, you're better able to make choices in terms of food, in terms of how to balance things. If it's hot and dry, like our weather has been hot and dry. If you are hot and dry because you're working hard, you're stressed out, then you understand, okay, to balance that, I need something cooling and moisturizing. So that's, that's the grid we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at a grid that looks like this and it derives from Chinese medicine. Each of these organs is associated with the season, et cetera. Now, are they alone? No, they were geniuses. The Chinese actually um, invented uh, the compass and printing, they invented paper. They use paper and even today, if you go to a traditional Chinese medicine store like the one I worked in in New York City in the village, they wrap the herbs in, the pa in paper. They don't put it in a little plastic bag, they wrap it in paper. So Chinese medicine, uh, again, has a long, long history. Ayurveda also, 2500 BC, right? Now, the interesting part is, yes, in Ayurveda, we have five elements. They do coalesce to become three doshas, but still, they're based on elements of nature. Why is that important for us in 2020? Because even though we have technology, even though we're seeing each other, we're sharing our information, we're sharing our feelings, we're sharing our perceptions. Our bodies haven't changed. Our bodies are the same. So therefore, the insights that these systems of medicine provide give us more information, equip us better. It's almost like being a boy or girl scout, putting together a backpack for life, right? To help you get through whatever may happen, right? Here are our three doshas. Again, we're not going to go into the details of this today. Um, and so the Silk Road, we've been looking at Asian part of it, but again, on the Eastern, Eastern Western part, it's going towards Persia, Bactria, Greece, and Rome. Gosh, Western medicine, not as ancient history as, as uh, Indian or Chinese. But one person I would like to mention is Avicenna, Ibn al-Senna. So we are, for most part, our culture is Eurocentric. We look at European history. We don't spend that much time uh, looking at other histories of other cultures. But what was very significant was that the medicine of China, the medicine of India, was collected together in Persia, in Baghdad, right? They were having medical conferences. That information was then combined with Greek medicine. So somebody like Avicenna could write a book called The Canon of Medicine. That information spread through Sicily, through Spain, and his textbook, The Canon of Medicine, was used as the medical textbook where? At the University of Paris Medical School. So in other words, it is a small world. And again, we are not looking at history of medicine today, but I think for many of us, it just expands our ideas of what was being shared. And in Greek medicine, um, we have humors, four humors. These are associated with, em with emotions. They're associated with seasons. So that idea is common to all of these. And common also is the idea of looking at wellness and that when we fall out of balance, there, we can remedy that. We are going to use pulse diagnosis. We're going to use uh, stool diagnosis. The body is a walking system of uh, communication. It is giving us information. Only we have, for the most part, kind of handed over responsibility to somebody in a white coat. So part of my endeavor is for this to come back to us, for, for us to take back the ability to understand at a very basic level what might be going on in ourselves, in our families, in our community, with our friends, et cetera. The emphasis also in these systems of medicine is on self-healing as much as we can. So again, understanding what we might be at risk for. If we are a person who's a very liver type of personality, very, uh, very dynamic, but also very wired, we may be heading towards certain kinds of diseases, right? And I would say that as a practitioner of Chinese medicine Ayurveda, that do I only use that? No. If somebody has lab tests, if they have MRIs, the more information, the better. 
right? So I look at it that way in terms of our community also. The more information we can get about ourselves and how to manage our, our, uh, our particular conditions, the better. They are all based on also a concept called chi in China, called prana in India, and called huma in Greece. The idea is that everything, whether we're looking at quantum physics or not, is based on energy patterns, patterns of energy. So when we look at these systems of medicine, like learning a second language for those who speak one or two or three or more languages, you know that it takes a little while. But then once you've internalized it, if you speak French, Italian, and Spanish, not so difficult, right? Also, they use herbs and dietary therapy, of course, in China, we use acupuncture. And the emphasis, most importantly, is on the individual. So individual differential diagnosis. Three students come in, they all have colds, they're all in the same age bracket, but each one has a different presentation. Each one may need different herbs, may need different acupuncture protocols. So this is just our background to see that um, these systems of medicine, uh, again, share many things in common. Now, um, I would I just ask, I'll stop the share for a second and ask if there are any questions before we get actually into foods, because I know we are on a tight schedule. Any questions? Just unmute yourself and ask if you have a class. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No? Not, not specifically about the material you're covering, but I'm wondering, um, will we have access to the video and maybe to the slides that you're using after um, the so presentation? I, so I would ask Eric, I would refer that question to Eric. The, vi the video will be posted online eventually on YouTube. Uh, that will, we have a YouTube channel on holistic health. And so that will be posted there. Uh, and Mary, email me and I'll send it to you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay. And if people have questions, please type them into the chat box and then we can also, inter you know, we can ask them and appropriately ask uh, Uma the questions. And speaking of community resources, I would just like to tell everybody that Mary is an accomplished herbalist and oh. she was on top of elderberry before it even became trendy. And she actually I don't know brought, about that. <laughs> she brought in she brought in elderberry tincture to class to share with her classmates. That's so um, we have various resources in the community that may not have been recognized. So a shout out to Mary. Okay. I'm blushing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let us get into the food because we uh, let's see. Oh yeah, we're all right. Okay. So. We are going to use the particular paradigm of Chinese medicine today because it is very clear. It is something we can understand easily. And we're in the hotbed of Chinese medicine here in the Bay Area. So um, these Chinese uh, doctors, uh, meditation masters, Qigong masters, develop different ways of what, we, what could be called today biohacking, meaning improving, um, uh, augmenting our energy, and or rectifying anything that might be uh, um, less than optimal. The important takeaway here, for those who've been in class before, know that everything in the natural world that we eat, that we put on our body, on our skin, that we put in our body, um, can affect our body in terms of temperature. It can cause dryness, it can cause heat, it can cause cold. Um, and so that idea, again, which is for, for many of us a new idea that each food has some kind of effect on us, it also can go to different, in Chinese medicine, go to different, uh, to different organ systems and also go to different acupuncture meridians. So food becomes something that, again, all of us eat. We can tweak foods with spices. So something like rice, pretty neutral dish, depending upon the weather you, you can, or, the, or your internal climate, you can tweak it with spices or you can tampen things down. So that's just to introduce the idea. This is the graph that I always draw on the board that represents everything that we consume, the biothermal, biothermal in that everything out there creates this in the body. When we say hot or heat, what do we mean in terms of biomedicine? We mean inflammation. Oh, exactly. So if we have someone in our family or ourselves who has diabetes, who has heart disease, who is undergoing uh, chemotherapy, radiation, which burn up the fluids in the body, right? 
knowing how we can manage that heat, knowing how we can manage that inflammation. And actually all the diseases that finally kill us, the degenerative diseases, all of them, the common thread is inflammation. So how to manage inflammation uh, is an important idea. And I would, I would recommend also Dr. Andrew Weil on his website, website he has a anti-inflammatory food pyramid, which does have good things on it like um, dark chocolate and other things. But so managing inflammation, very, very important key. Um, for us today, just off the top of the bat, what does it mean when we have heat? So this is what it means if we have heat. We are possibly red in the face. We may be sweating. Everybody else is wearing socks and we're wearing sandals, right? Uh, we may have a rash. We might be thirsty. We might be dry, right? Also, we're not do doing that today, but I use, and Chinese medicine uses, the tongue as a barometer of what's going on in the body. So that tongue, if it's red, is gonna tell you. If the fur is yellow, it's gonna tell you that, hey, I've got too much heat. Maybe having some spicy panang curry and a shot of brandy is not a good idea today, right? <laughs> so the idea of modulating, of changing with the seasons, of changing with your particular climate, that's what's important. In, in Greek uh, Heraclitus and also the Tao says what? Things are always changing. So we are not a fixed entity, we're dynamic beings. And that's where Chinese medicine responds. What you gave a patient last week may not be herbs or points that you give them this week because their body has changed. Right? So recognizing heat in ourselves or others, what could we just do about it? Off the top of our heads, cucumbers, watermelon, moon beans, right? And some of these we're going to look, sorry, we're going to look at in detail. What about cold, right? So how do we know we're cold? Well, we feel cold. We want hot drinks. I always run a little on the hot side. I want something cool. Other family members run on the cool side. They want something hot. Grew up in the same household, but different constitutions, right? What can we do? How can we tweak that with what we have at home? Ginger, garlic, black pepper, alcohol. If you're stuck in the mountains of Switzerland, you skied off, off, uh, off into some remote area and they send a St. Bernard, I'm just joking, but they used to send a St. Bernard with a little keg around his neck. What did that have in there, right? That had brandy in it. it had alcohol, mm -hmm. alcohol warms yeah. you up temporarily. Is it a good solution in the long run? No, but temporarily it moves the blood. That means as blood circulates better, you feel warmer, right? Dryness. Dryness of our skin, dryness of our lips, dryness of our hair. <laughs> that lingering cough that just doesn't go away, right? After maybe a course of antibiotics, after a course of chemo, radiation. So natural things that are moisturized. So this is just to recognize hot, cold, dry. What about moist? Moisture when there's too much dampness. We may have fungus under our toenails. We may have a heavy feeling. We may, we may have stool that's slimy. So I do tell students to become poopologists, to look at your poop, because it gives you information, right? If you're a parent, you've already looked at your child's poop, right? So <laughs> poop tells you what's going just in the same way that menstrual blood tells women what's going on in their body. The color, bright red, too much heat. Dark, not moving enough, stagnation. So these... When people say to me, is Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, are they scientific? I'm like, if you mean observing human behavior and the reaction of human beings and their constitutions to herbs and everything in the natural world over centuries, hmm, that seems to me pretty empirical. And also, things don't stay around unless they work. A patient doesn't come back unless they get relief from their symptoms. So in the same way, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Tibetan medicine have stood the test of time. Right? In dampness, what could we use? Barley millet, millet, we're gonna look at those, ginger, but that's when there's regular dampness. But what about we are in Singapore or we're in, uh, we are in um, New Orleans in August? Then it's not just damp, but it's hot. You get out of the shower and you start sweating before you put your clothes on. That's when we wanna use moon beans, soy, dandelion, seaweed, right? So this is just to give us an idea of um, how to recognize what we can recognize. I'm gonna stop again and see if there are any questions and then we will, we will race through, yeah, we're doing pretty good in terms of time. Then we will look at some food. So any questions? 
dazed. Everyone is dazed. Well, <laughs> Uma, I not as much a question, but just a comment, which may yeah. be very helpful. Yes. You know, one of the reasons why so often scientific studies have said, ah, there's no data there when you give people specific foods. And the, the most recent data comes, it's a whole British uh, analysis in which they're now looking at food and we realize that healthy food is not nutri nutrients. It's a giant mixture of many hundreds, thousands of different molecules which all together make us healthy. And 99% of the food we eat we don't even know what all the micronutrients are. And so what you're talking about is really a saying you want to have organic whole foods, which you take in, which is totally different than taking an ax extract. And often these foods are done in combination with others and only together do they really get some of these effects. And that is almost antith antithetical to how much of the previous dietary research has been done. That's true. And so, yes, and to add on to that, to layer on, we want to eat seasonally and locally. So, for example, we have Chez Panisse over here in Berkeley. That was a radical idea at the time, to eat seasonally and locally. I remember my grandmother telling me that when she was a little girl, a very special treat. In those days, women wore many petticoats. Her grandmother would lift up the petticoat and there was a pocket in the inner petticoat. And she would pull out a banana. Now, in those days, in the 1800s on the East Coast, a banana was a very exotic fruit, right? So that is interesting because we also want to be cognizant. If you are in Wisconsin in January, a banana does not grow there, right? It is going to cause mm. dampness and coldness and stagnation. So therefore, understanding how to eat what is seasonal, what is local, and what is appropriate for your constitution. Again, food is not, at the, is not the only solution. What, when we look at these systems of medicine, they're multimodal. So we want to adjust our diet, we want to adjust exercise, we want to take care of stress. And again, in class, I will also mention things that are not only Chinese or only Ayurvedic, like Bach flower remedies. So Bach flower remedies are wonderful for stress, right? They are nutraceuticals. So there are other things that are out there that we can use um, to manage our particular what imbalance if we if we have an imbalance. Okay, well, I'm going to go back. Any other questions? That's from the chat. And yes. Asks about feeling cold or feeling bloated, and those might be two separate or might be linked. Cold and or bloated. Okay, so the to the bloated part, um, we have to think of food allergies. This never used to be the case, but increasingly, um, and I say this as a person who has personally experienced this which is traveling abroad, um, you get dysentery, it goes away, you manage it, you come back. But if that's repeated, that damages the terrain. It, it damages what we call these days the gut biome. So one thing to notice first is if there's something that you keep eating that uh, is making you, f every time you eat it, you feel bloated. Maybe it's something that seems very innocent like oats. You're like, oats? Like, so one possibility is to just notice when you feel symptomatic, right? When does that bloated feeling occur? Does it occur every time you eat something? And then if that's the case, maybe we cut down or maybe avoid completely. Otherwise, Cyrex, w and, and so what I would say is look at this. You don't have to get the test done. www.cyrex, labs, L-A-B-S, dot com. And you look under, um, uh, arrays, which are tests, uh, three and four. And those are food sensitivities. What is interesting there is there are some things that you don't think about that are cross-reactive. For example, coffee. Maybe you're not allergic to gluten. Maybe you're not allergic to oats. Maybe those don't turn up on the lab tests, but coffee, your body understands the coffee molecule in the same way that it understands a gluten molecule. So this is of uh, my own personal experience, traveling, having traveled a lot in India and China. So damage the gut biome, that, I, don't, I don't have time, but there's a whole, there is a whole, that is a whole other area. It is manageable. Everything is manageable. That is the beautiful thing that about uh, Chinese medicine, once we have a clear picture, once you get a clear, clear picture of what your particular um, constitution is and 
what issues may be going on. So Bach flower remedies, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Be it, like, like, like Johann Sebastian Bach, okay? <laughs> um, about the cold part. So then first thing I would say, the weather is cold and damp today. I'm not sure where you are, wherever the question came from. So ginger tea, right? Things that are going to warm you up. Also, if mm. at the first, if you feel you got a chill, you went out for a walk or a run, and you came back and you feel that little feeling like, gosh, I think I should have worn more, right? The first thing to do is to take a hot bath or hot shower, drink some ginger tea, bundle up and sweat it out. Sweat out the pathogen so it doesn't go deeper, right? Okay, I need to stay on track. Otherwise, Eric is gonna be not a happy camper. So I will go back to share screen. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, sure, giving me sure. those. Okay, so Caravan Kitchen, just to see again that this, this is going, Urumqi, that's where our mummies are. And I was actually used to be at the university, I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, and Victor Mayer, M-A-I-R, who is a wonderful scholar, a Chinese scholar, sinologist. I'm an Indologist and he's a sinologist. And his office was right next to my advisor's office. So they would be outside while I was waiting to have an appointment with my advisor. They would be having like, uh, you know, shop talk. And I was the fly on the wall. And it was just fascinating because I, I, never, I never realized that, uh, you know, human migration is, is so vast. So there are a number of foods here. Our time is limited. What you just want to write down is barley. Barley is cool, right? And the most important thing about barley is it gets rid of dampness. Dampness meaning, again, maybe slimy stool, maybe, um, maybe a, a, a nonstop vaginal discharge, right? Maybe um, water retention. Can't close your jeans when you have your period, when you start your period, right? Maybe goo goo in your eyes when you wake up in the morning. Maybe particularly sticky um, earwax, right? So that's the important thing with barley. Barley, you can as in the photograph here, you can serve it like you would rice. You could put it in a mushroom beef soup. You could use barley um, um, flour also. And that's what they do traditionally in Asia also. Um, so, and you, how can you make it if you can't find flour? You can put it in a coffee grinder, grind it up, make flour, and make like a kind of a, a tortilla out of it. Hmm? So, oops. So barley, so these first four are grains but they're a little bit different. Millet, millet, not something that we eat a lot of, but very valuable in that increases alkalinity in the body if we're too acid. Also, if we have any kind of candida issues. It's also good during pregnancy, hello, for those who may have pregnant family members. Um, and you can also, it is slightly warming, right? And you can also buy a millet flour, again, uh, just to use it in a different way. Millet, both of these barleys and millet, you could stuff. It, just like you stuff a green pepper, you could use them uh, to stuff some. And rice. Rice, again, every culture has rice. Um, there's a wonderful book called Pimp My Rice. So rice mm. is neutral. It is moisturizing. When they make uh, rice pilaf or pilau in India, Traditionally, they put in some spices like um, cinnamon, like cloves, things that are going to compensate for the moisturizing, damp producing quality of rice, right? So it produces fluids. Right? So joke, that is rice porridge. That is the Chinese comfort food. My partner who passed away last uh, September uh, was Chinese. And when he was feeling out of sorts, he didn't want haagen -Dazs, He didn't want brownies. He didn't want ribs. He wanted joke, right? So it is also something good, any, and again, it doesn't have to be Chinese joke, but something that is easy to digest late at night. So just in the same way that we are tied to nature and the natural world, we're tired, tied to the natural cycle. So this time of day, the middle of the day, when the sun is at its peak, if we could see it, except for the smoke, um, this is when we, our own internal digestive fire is at, is at its peak. So this is the time, if you're going to eat some raw foods, if you can tolerate raw foods, uh, this is the time to have some raw foods, things that are harder to digest. If you want raw cauliflower in your salad or whatever. As we go towards the evening, the later evening, when we had in-person classes, often those classes would end around 10 o'clock at night, right? So then by the time a student or, or a faculty member gets home, it might be 11, 
you're a little hungry, but you don't want to tax your digestive system by eating too much. You don't want to have that big burrito sitting in there like a brick, right? Because then you can't sleep well. All your energy is going to be spent instead of, instead of cleaning out your brain, instead of uh, uh, repairing any, any cellular damage, it's going to be stuck in your stomach digesting something difficult. So that's where rice comes in, right? As a, as a good food, a joke or, or a minestrone, something easy to digest. Wheat. Again, wheat, not for me anymore, because I've become uh, gluten sensitive, right? But wheat is not bad in, in and of itself, right? It clears heat. It's good for irritability. Um, too much wheat, pasta every, every single day can create some dampness because again, it's cooling, right? Mung beans. Those are those little green beans. If you go to a Vietnamese restaurant, there are going to be some sprouted mung, right? On a little plate with some, um, some basil leaves. In China, they make mung bean pops, popsicles, right? And um, there's a restaurant not far from here called Daimo. In the summertime, they make a mung bean sweet soup dessert, right? So mung beans, very useful, very humble. They're not very, um, they're not dramatic. They're not superstars. They're not divas. They are just a humble little bean. But again, if we look at just what it does, oh, high blood pressure, hmm, right? atherosclerosis, um, nausea, etc. So again, toxicity from wherever, if that's food, food poisoning, alcohol, toxic pesticides. Um, so you can sprout them and use them sprouted. You can, in the Indian stores, you can get them without the green shell, right? You can get them split, in which case they're yellow. You can mix that with rice and make a classic kind of Ayurvedic, the Ayurvedic equivalent of joke, which is called kitchari very easy to digest when you're sick or you just want something nutritious, but that's not going to tax your digestive system. Um, and then, yes, okay, I confess, yes, I am, the, I am the history buff a little. I'll zip through here, but just to say that grapes, right? Grapes were a very exotic item and um, initially come from, uh, from Central Asia, right? So, and they're still used today. So with grapes, we can see that grapes, again, generate fluids for dryness, tonify the blood. Um, and there are different kinds of grapes. Um, again, like Eric suggested, we do want to try to buy, maybe we buy less, but we want to try to buy organic. Um, and my heart goes out to all those workers in the Central Valley who are picking fruits and vegetables, men, women, and children, picking them for us to eat while they're being exposed not only to the pandemic, but also exposed to, to smoke. So um, we want to be mindful of that and grateful to those workers. Apples, everybody thinks, oh, it's as American as apple pie. Um, in fact, apples are actually native to Central Asia, right? And they spread from Central Asia down into, uh, uh, down towards the Mediterranean and also down in, and I remember even in India, now, my husband is from India. My, well, first of all, my mother's Russian. My husband's from India. My kids were born in India. In India, at a certain time, when the children were very small, um, apples were a luxury. They were coming from Kashmir. But they were a luxury item. You'd be like, oh, you know, somebody would call you. I, I saw some apples in this market, right? Oh, OK, right? So we take it for granted because they're just everywhere. But um, again, there are a lot of genetic diversity in terms of apples. Apples are cooling, yes. Um, can be good for, in, for somebody who's, di who's watching their blood sugar, does not want to go down uh, the track of diabetes. Um, and so they are a, a generally a very positive, again, if you have difficulty diagnose, uh, excuse me, digesting raw fruits, what would you do? You do what they do in Europe, right? You just slightly steam, saute, right? So in Europe, often it shocks you when you're American in the beginning, when you come there and they serve a fruit compote. You're like, what? And then you realize that's completely smart. Absolutely, yes, because if your digestion is, is not that strong that day, you can still get the benefit of that. So for us also, it's cooling, apples are cooling. How can we warm that up? Cinnamon, right? So we can just slice that apple, put it in this frying pan and put sprinkle a little cinnamon on it and uh, warm it up. Yeah, so pomegranates <laughs> are um, again used in, uh, in all different cultures. 
and associated with fertility. They are readily available here. I know you can get palm wonderful juice. So I would definitely recommend pomegranate juice. If we look at this, anti-inflammatory, heart health. Again, like anything, um, food is medicine, herbs are medicine. So if somebody is taking comedin or warfarin, right? Um, then we just want to be mindful right, of that because it has that, uh, that property. Apricots, also anti-inflammatory, heart health. Very good for pregnancy as well. Um, because of the high iron content, right? Um, and then, gee, I don't know if we can get to, we got what, like nine minutes left, Eric, right? Uh, maybe I'll skip the, this part, the historical part, um, just to say that almonds, so we got different kinds of nuts here, almonds, um, which are moisturizing, good for cholesterol, insulin sensitivity, I'll skip pistach pistachios, high blood pressure, in high blood lipids, right? Um, and again, we are walnuts. Walnuts um, are warm compared to the other two nuts. Right? Improved brain function. They're often and if you think of a if you think of a walnut, think of the two hemispheres of the brain, right? So it's easy association. But they're warming in the hot, dry weather. Um, and also, you can use walnuts. You don't have to eat them just in granola or a trail mix. You can actually cook them with uh, with corn. Corn and mustard seeds. I have personally cooked that and it's extremely tasty. So there are different ways of using nuts. In the West, we just tend to think mostly that we have to use nuts um, by the handful, but you can use them, of course, in cooking as they do in Persian cuisine, Indian cuisine. Saffron. Saffron, very expensive even today. There are actually um, frescoes of monkeys in Crete picking saffron. It is, if we look at it, in Chinese medicine, it's in the invigorate blood, meaning it moves the blood. So that could be used as a blood thinner for high blood pressure, postpartum, after delivery, any kind of blood clots or PMSing, right? So if you're PMSing, you could put some saffron on top of your, uh, on top of your golden milk, right? Before going to sleep. Also erectile dysfunction. Um, cardiovascular health. So again, we're not going to use it every day all the time. That's the thing to take away too, that we use things judiciously as needed. Um, black pepper, I'll just say that it was uh, the, that Romans used to come to the southern coast of India. They came with gold coins and they left with black pepper. Right? Hot, drying, uh, caution, right? If we have uh, any dryness associated with those. So if we drink chai, we want to make our own chai. My relatives from India always laugh. They come here, they're like, you're paying four, whatever, 450 for chai at Starbucks. That's crazy. We can make it. At a... That's one thing. But the other thing is the spices that are in it. A cold, damp day, you weren't warming spices, right? Like cinnamon. Good for also blood sugar. So those like myself who have diabetes in your family, cinnamon is a good thing, yeah? but it's hot. Coriander, cilantro, coriander as well, right? Again, the, um, is, is warming, balances the digestive system. You see it often as a garnish on a dish, right? But I would say just as with parsley, eat the garnish, right? Ginger, warming. The thing to remember is that dry ginger is more warming than fresh ginger. So you want to use a smaller amount. Mm -hmm. Turmeric. A lot of us are familiar with turmeric. It's the kind of a spice of the month or, or of the, this particular time. Again, yes, it moves blood. If you're going in for some dental surgery, you may want to stop taking your turmeric supplements before so that you don't, um, you don't bleed more, right? And then we're coming to the end almost here, astragalus or huangqi. This is a classic Chinese herbs. Why did I put it in here? Because of number two, it helps you with your, um, your immune system. It, it is an immunomodulator. So it is something that we could use to recover from something and or to help our immune system not come down with something. Oases, important tea. We've got one more slide left. So it was Buddhist monks, among others, who were carrying tea with them. And all of us might be ready 
for a cup of tea, I would recommend uh, green tea. It is cooling. Um, it is slightly bitter and sweet, but again, it has lower caffeine than let's say black tea or other teas. So, um, so I think that I'm sorry for rushing through and I apologize for the little glitch in transmission there. And so I'm going to stop the slideshow now and see if we have any questions. Hi there, Uma. I put some, a question in the chat. Sure. Which was basically, did you have any specific recommendations for us um, in terms of what sorts of foods we could eat to help us with the smoke and toxic air that we're all living through? And so, thank you for the presentation. Sure, sure, of course. So you want, first of all, to close the windows if you can and put on an air purifier if possible. <laughs> Definitely wear a mask when you go out. And the other thing would be things that support the lungs. So um, again, whether you do pranayama, so first of all, just to the physical part of it, um, uh, whether you do pranayama or not, I would uh, also just suggest singing. At the top of your lungs, um, in the shower, in your pri privacy of wherever. Again, we want to just, uh, and I, I see this very dramatically because um, one of my family members has a COPD. And what happens there is the lungs become fibrous. And so we do want to be um, mindful of, uh, of particulates that are in the air. These are just, this, this is not just a bonfire on Stinson Beach, right? Um, those particulates that are in that smoke outside are particulates that can lodge in the lungs and not necessarily come out. So the lungs love moisture, therefore, you want to, uh, particularly on those days where if you have to go out, super hydrate, um, avoid drying and heating spices and or foods, chilies, cloves, ginger, black pepper, those dry things out even more. Right? And I would say again, um, with, uh, with liquids, um, maybe room temperature, not cold, um, and this, when it, not that we can go to restaurants anymore, but it used to be you would ask somebody, could I have water, no ice? And inevitably, they're going to bring, you know, this doesn't happen in Europe. In Europe, people don't bring you a glass that's like full of ice. They, they don't do it um, because that chills your digestive system. So we want to have a, a balance uh, kind of between, between, the, between the heat and the fluids, right, in our bodies. So otherwise, there aren't any, there are some foods that go to the lungs in particular, but there's a whole long list. I would think of things like um, asparagus, um, kiwi, um, uh, eucalyptus, right? Things that are uh, eucalyptus tea. Uh, certainly, even traditional medicinals has a breathe easy tea. If you feel that, oh, you know, I might have been exposed to something. I love that company. They were, that company, they were already, they were years ago, they understood how they can help us by providing uh, herbal support and, and put it into the local supermarkets. So, um, so any other, I don't know if I answered that. I would say also essential oils. Yes, essential yes let me oils. make a comment for a sec. Yeah, lavender. Do this. And, and that is for those who are seeing I think I want to underline what Uma said when it's smoky outside. You want to do it in your house where the air has already been filtered, like with a HEPA filter, because otherwise you're inhaling very deeply outside when you inhale. Although it's great to do the singing because it will, you know, it will ventilate the lower lobes of the lungs, but you'll also get the particulates in. And finally, but during this time when you're outside, really only breathe through your nose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I see, I wish I can do more questions. I apologize. Hi, Janet, Janet, you yes. have a question? Okay. A we'll quick one. Question. Yes. A quick one. It and this has relates. to be quick. Make it it's every, quick, whatever quick, you want. quick. Can we just get to it? <laughs> it, it relates to turmeric powder in yeah. water as a tea in the morning. Is that a good benefit or just a tea? <laughs> I think just the tea. Uh, if you had, depends what way you have the, the turmeric. If it's in a capsule, I would just say you could swallow the capsule, right? However, it's a powder. Mm -hmm. it's a powder. Then yeah. uh, that's, a good, that's a good thing. What I often recommend um, to patients and to students, and what I do personally 
for example, you want things to go into the bloodstream right away because you're feeling symptomatic or you don't want to get symptomatic. How can it go into the bloodstream right away? Sublingual. Sublingual means if it is a little capsule that you can chew without breaking a tooth, chew it. Otherwise, put it in mm. some um, paper towel and just crush it with a rolling pin or with the heel of your shoe or whatever, a hammer or whatever you've got, your back of the spoon, right? And then drink it. If it is in a capsule, you could open that capsule, yes, and put it in some hot water and drink that and it'll go into the bloodstream right away. So that is Thank always you. the best way to take things. The only thing I would not take, would not try to, to chew are the little black Chinese tea pills because they look like little BBs and they're very hard. You could break a tooth. So then again, you can crush, you know, in a mortar pestle, et cetera. I mean, I gave some getaways to do it in a mortar pestle. But so Thank you. Yeah. The other thing to consider with the COVID is one of the symptomatic things that people didn't recognize early on, they were looking at the um, respiratory symptoms, right? But what went along with that is the thickness, thickening of the blood, the coagulating of the blood. So those of us who are older, we already, our blood is already thicker. We are getting little spots like you cannot or maybe can see or not, which shows that, oh, the blood is not moving as efficiently as when I was 25. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where turmeric is our friend. Oh, okay. you, you just answered my question. I was going to ask about that. Look at that, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Brain wind. <laughs> and I thank you all so much for participating and attending the session. And again, thank you, Uma. Thank you so much for inviting me, Eric. Thank you.